Hi, everyone. This is Joe Young. I'm with Global Data Systems. I'm the president and CEO of the company. I wanted to thank you all for joining us today in what we hope is a very informative 60 minutes. We've put together this webinar to hopefully answer many of the questions you have regarding why cities and towns need to be aware of and protect yourself from the very real, often embarrassing, and costly threats that are happening today. For those of you who are not familiar with GDS, we're a network and security consulting and services provider located here in Massachusetts. Our corporate headquarters is in Pembroke, and we provide cloud-based solutions, managed services, and consulting services in the network and security space. Our security practice is experienced with the regulations and policies that directly affect state and local government agencies. Through our assessment processes, we provide these agencies with the direction to protect themselves from the ever-changing threat landscape. And to help you understand these threats, and with us today is Chris Ralph. Chris is the Director of Information Security for Global Data Systems. He has over 10 years of experience providing security and risk assessments for entities in many regulated markets. And over the years, he's created processes and policies that are still used and adhered to today by many organizations in multiple market segments. He has a thorough knowledge of the changing threat landscape and the requirements to protect and minimize risk exposure. And so without further delay, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Chris. All right, cool. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Stuart. Good morning. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about here regarding municipalities protecting themselves from all the bad stuff that can happen so it's going to be tough to fit it all into one uh, webinar so we're going to keep it fairly high level and I hope I can avoid going too uh, too fast but uh, we're going to try to fit a lot of stuff in so we're going to basically talk about these uh, keep it to these four objectives here we're going to just start off briefly uh, recapping kind of a little bit of what happened in, uh, in, in Wayland to remind us kind of what one of the main triggers for, for doing this webinar, uh, and then discuss the basics of security management and, and risk management overall, what we need to do to protect ourselves, and then get a little bit more uh, specific um, in how we're going to do that specifically for municipalities. And then, uh, assuming there's still time, we're going to get a little bit deeper dive into some incident handling and uh, response ideas. All right. So as far as um, what occurred in, in, in Wayland, maybe everybody already knows this, but uh, there was an attacker out there that almost succeeded in sort of hacking into the town's uh, bank account and, and withdrawing uh, reportedly over $4 million from the, uh, from the town's accounts. Uh, the attack was not prevented or detected or stopped in any way by the town, but rather by the town's bank, thankfully, for the town. Um, the town just wasn't uh, wasn't prepared to handle something like that. How the attacker got in initially, the attacker was able to infect at least one PC on the on the town's network that that gave him some information on uh, the banks that they use and so forth, and enough information about their banking accounts that the attacker was then able to actually call it, I believe, via email or or phone call, was able to trick one of the town's employees into revealing more information about the uh, the town's banking accounts by posing as a, a representative from the town's bank. Uh, and the reason that he was successful in doing that was most likely based on the information that he was able to collect through the malware attack on that compromised PC. So that's how that, in a nutshell, how that attack almost became successful. So what do we need to do is we need to be prepared to, you know, in advance to be able to address something like that happening in our in our city or town. So we want to have a uh, security and risk management program. And in order to do that, we need to understand the uh, the what, why, who, and how. So that's what we're going to talk about next, what, why, who, and how. And the what is, we need to understand what it is that we need to protect. We know, we know we're going to protect the confidenti confidentiality or privacy and the integrity and the availability of our critical and sensitive assets, but we'll get a little bit more specific on that, but that's the what, what we're protecting. Um, why, um, you'll understand a little bit later why the why is important, uh, why we need to protect it, and we're going to get into some, what I describe as real, all caps, reasons that we're protecting it. What I mean by that is not just because it's our 
policy or our boss says that we need to protect it, but the real, real reasons. Um, the who is really almost like another what, but it's what we're protecting the what from. So basically, our threats. And then lastly, when we really get into the meat of this uh, webinar, I'm going to give you some ideas of how you can uh, achieve all that, how we can protect the, the what. Okay. PII is really, you know, this is the what, what we're protecting, especially from a confidentiality uh, standpoint, we're protecting personally identifiable information. Um, also comes into play strongly when we're thinking about compliance and the uh, Massachusetts state privacy law, right? Not so much um, relates to what happened in Wayland because that was more of an attack against their, their, their financial systems, but this is still really important and a lot of the webinar is about protecting confidentiality of PII because that's one of the things that cities and towns should be uh, should be doing. So what is PII? And hopefully the um, text of the uh, state law here is not too small to read, but basically it's uh, uh, a comp uh, information that includes an individual's name in combination with some type of identifying number, particularly a social security number, but could also be a driver's license number or a financial account number. Uh, it's still considered PII even if you have just a financial account number without you know, like a PIN number or some type of security access code that would be required to use that account number. That's that's not required to be PII. It just needs to be enough information to uh, identify that information as belonging to an individual, essentially. So that's what we're protecting primarily the uh, confidentiality of, right? There are other critical and sensitive assets that we need to focus on. Again, the financial info is town of Wayland learned kind of the hard way. Um, account access info also kind of relates to what happened in Wayland because the person almost you know got access information that they needed to access some some banking account information, right? If you think about you know many municipalities, I think may have um, like a group health plan, some type of um, health care plan that could be considered uh, HIPAA. Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, so you may not uh, realize it, but you may be bound to um, some of the re requirements of the HIPAA rule as well. And again, it's um, as far as what we're protecting of out of these sensitive and critical assets, we need to protect the confidentiality or the privacy of it, which means implementing safeguards to prevent unauthorized access, basically. Uh, the integrity, we want to make sure that we're preventing uh, unauthorized changes to our information, and then availability, just like it sounds, we want to make sure that um, if it's a you know critical asset, that it's always available to the people that really need it in order to to accomplish their their missions. Um, PII generally the main you know where where is it as part of the what is we want to know where it is. Um, you've got municipality management systems like Munis and uh, you know several other. Examples, what we use out there, Munis, I see that, that one a lot, though. That's why I use that as an example, but there's uh, certainly a lot of PII in there. doesn't include um, public record, by the way. Um, besides PII or besides our municipality management systems, you're going to find un unstructured data. By that, I mean maybe even on people's PCs. Uh, hopefully not. We should always try to avoid that, but... Um, I'm sure it, it it happens. File shares and and uh, you know folders that are shared on our file servers and so forth, where people are creating Office documents, Excel docs, or Word docs that have all kinds of uh, PII in them. Um, there's probably PII in many of our email messages, certainly in the uh, ba uh, backup media that we use to back up our municipality management systems and all of those shared folders on our servers, right? Um, portable devices. We're trying to avoid saving. PII, for example, on, on PCs, well, if you're going to do that, hopefully you're not saving it on your laptops either, uh, but if you are, or if there's a chance that it's on your laptops, then you might want to think about encrypting them, and that, that, that's more of a, a technical, physical control that we'll talk about more later. But also, PII doesn't need to be electronic, it's, it's all of those uh, thick files of paper that we store in our filing cabinets as well. We need to protect that as well from unauthorized access when we're talking about confidentiality. Uh, so that's the what we're protecting, um, where it is and so forth. Uh, so 
there are reasons why I want to talk about why we were protecting it. Well, one reason, and this isn't, in my opinion, one of the real reasons, but there's the, law, the fact that it's the law. We mentioned when, when I said mass privacy law, I'm talking about 201 CMR 17.00. Now you know why we just call it the privacy law. <laughs> uh, HIPAA, as I mentioned, because of the possibility of group health plans and so forth. Um, and both of those laws have fines and, and penalties involved, so that's supposed to add teeth to that and uh, sort of help us along as far as complying with it. But like I said, in my opinion, that's not the, the real reason because if you just tell your users, hey, you've got to you know, jump through these rings of fire because it's the law, yeah, they're going to be, I think, a little bit less inclined to uh, comply than if they understand what, what I think of as are the real reasons. And the real reasons are because because uh, people generally are, I think, nice people and want to be helpful and so forth. They don't want to uh, impact uh, individuals or innocent people by uh, risking ha them having to go through the pains of an of a, of a you know identity theft. So if our people and our users, employees that have access to PII, understand some of the bad things that can happen as a result of you know a, a mistake on their part or unauthorized disclosure of PII and identity theft and all that, I think then they're going to be more inclined to cooperate with an information security program and want to uh, protect confidentiality and integrity and availability of PII for, again, the, the, the real reasons. So to prevent an impact to our the reputation of our city and town and our citizens and so forth and that type of thing. So because identity theft um, really is is painful to the to individuals and now to the perpetrators as well. Um, and that stuff does have value on the black market, and there are legitimate threats, um, groups, hacker groups, and so forth that are actually going after that stuff. And some of those people are, are very uh, educated and, and well-funded and, and, and tooled uh, Groups that basically make a pretty good living out of stealing PII and stealing, you know, healthcare information from from practices and low-hanging fruit and that type of thing. So the threats are definitely out there, and uh, we just want to avoid being a victim, right? Um, so what are we protecting this stuff from? This is the who. So we know what we're protecting, our critical assets and, and, and our, you know, personally identifiable information. We're protecting confidentiality, that and so forth. Um, and we know why, because we don't want to hurt people. Um, but what we're protecting it from, we call the threats. And there are plenty of them out there. Um, we'll break them down into internal and external threats. Everyone, I think, is aware of the, uh, you know, external threats. Generally think of hackers out on the internet and so forth as external threats and the, the, um, the attacker or attackers that um, impacted the town of Wayland basically were an external threat leveraging the, the internet and social engineering types of attacks and so forth. But um, a, a threat doesn't even need to have malicious intent. It could be something accidental. Uh, so that generally involves internal threats. So we kind of have to think even of our own employees and users that have authorized access to these uh, assets as a potential threat, particularly if they're uh, uneducated. I say uneducated there. What I really mean is that you don't yet have a end user security awareness training program, which is something we're going to talk about. Hopefully we'll see why that, that's important, but um, that kind of relates to are our users going to be uh, vulnerabilities? on our network or are our users going to be safeguards and that really depends on whether they're educated slash trained or not so that's really important um, then there you know there is the malicious intent intentional access by an unauthorized individual right the attacker at Wayland somebody sort of hacking in unintentional incidental access if we're uh, an employee in town hall and you know reviewing uh, some type of record in the in the munis, in munis or whatever with some PII in it we need to be aware of who's standing around and able to see that screen that's that you know even though it's uh, sort of incidental access it's still un unauthorized disclosure um, authorized users could also abuse their rights and, and access PII for the wrong reason basically any reason that isn't directly related to their business objective or the city or town's business objective is inappropriate access and it's actually specifically uh, illegal based on you know tool and uh, CMR 17 right the uh, mass privacy law 
unplanned system downtime, it is another another threat. Uh, you know, the specific threat agents for that or anything like a, a hard drive failing or a server crashing or a network switch going down and something that prevents your authorized users from being able to access these critical systems. So that's talking, of course, about availability. And then malicious software. Well, yeah, we could go on and on about that. I'm sure most of us have been able to experience the, the joys of having to clean up after some type of virus attack. So it's so important to have uh, any virus software, which again is kind of a technical control. Here's a uh, screenshot. Um, Maybe we can see it better if I do this. Of uh, a particularly nasty virus that's been out for a while, uh, called CryptoLogger type of ransomware. Uh, this particular type of virus uh, will, once it is able to infect a PC, will go ahead and encrypt a fairly long list of file types, including Office documents and PDF files and all kinds of stuff that's probably important to you and makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to decrypt it. They basically demand that you send them some some money uh, and the attackers will give you a key so that you can decrypt it yourself. And a, and a lot of people actually went ahead and did pay it and get the, uh, the decryption key that way, so I guess that was effective <laughs> for somebody. Risk assessment, also another important thing. The reason I bring up risk assessment here is because we've, we've spoken about the what, the what we're protecting, the assets and so forth, and uh, what we're protecting it from, the who, and those are really two key fundamental components that we need to know and have documented for a risk assessment. So as we're collecting that information, why not make that part of the risk assessment? Do it at the same time, uh, document the what, the assets, what the assets are and where they are, in this risk assessment report. And then as we're identifying the what we're protecting it from, the who, the threats, document that in the risk assessment report as well. And boom, you've got your framework for your uh, risk assessment. Now you just need to come up with the uh, values for likelihood and so forth. So the really uh, the objective of the risk assessment is to determine and document the degree to which our assets are at risk to the threats. And it's really based on the likelihood or how likely a particular threat is going to have an impact, a negative impact, to one of the assets. So that's that's the likelihood. It's really based on uh, how vulnerable our assets are to those threats. So as we see here in the middle of this slide, uh, if we're going to come up with a risk factor, whether it's a, a number one through ten or low, medium, high for um, for our assets, we're going to use some type of formula that's basically based on the likelihood of that threat, like a virus, for example, impacting our asset um, times how important or how valuable that asset is. Or another way of looking at it would be uh, the next bullet down, the, the, the magnitude of the impact combined with the uh, likelihood of the threat having an impact. So it's really almost like a glass half full or glass half empty look. But it's basically, in a nutshell, the same thing coming up with, um, for coming up with a risk factor. Uh, and then another reason for, for doing the risk assessment uh, now and talking about it now is because once it's completed, you get uh, all kinds of useful information uh, I think here on that would be very useful when we're creating our information security program that we're going to talk about later because it's going to you know once we see where our specific risks are we're going to know how to tailor that program to uh, address those critical risks first early on in the process right so we know the what what we're protecting we know why we're protecting it and hopefully it's because you know we care about preventing you know identity theft and protecting the reputation of our town and all that not just because we're being told to do it uh, we know the who the what we're protecting it from unauthorized access on planned downtime that type of thing so let's get right into the how uh, first thing we mention here is due diligence and common sense uh, mostly because that applies to everyone so we're going to talk about that first um, the next thing we will discuss is managing and reducing vulnerabilities because like we just said, um, if we want to reduce risk, well, we need to either reduce the asset value or the likelihood or we need to reduce the impact and the likelihood. But you can't really reduce the asset value or the impact, can we? But we may be able to control the likelihood by because it's directly related to how vulnerable we are. So if we're able to make ourselves less vulnerable, then we're able to make those threats less 
likely. So we're going to focus on reducing and managing vulnerabilities, and that's really how we're going to manage risk. Uh, and then we're going to talk specifically about the uh, actual information security program, which is basically administrative types of safeguards that we implement to, uh, to protect confidentiality, availability, and integrity. And then lastly, the physical and technical safeguards, like we mentioned earlier, our antivirus software and that type of thing. Those would also be mentioned in the information security program, but the actual nuts and bolts of those controls and safeguards would be classified as physical or technical safeguards. So we'll talk about those last, and here we go, due diligence, common sense, yeah. This is important uh, to, to everybody that has access to PII because it relates to, you know, how they... Um, pull that stuff up, like we mentioned, incidental access, being aware of your uh, surroundings when you have, you know, a file open either on your desktop, you know, paper file on your desk or uh, on your screen in the Munis system or whatever you're using. Um, I mentioned about users being a, a vulnerability to your organization or being a safeguard. Um, if you've got users that know to question and report anything that they see that going on around them that, that may be suspicious, then they're, they're really becoming more of a control, aren't they? But um, to make them that, we, we, we need to make them aware by through, through training and all that. Um, if we, all, we can also make them less likely to, uh, to fall prey to a social engineering attack if we can train them to recognize that type of thing. And then, of course, we read about this all the time about, you know, opening email uh, uh, attachments from untrusted sources and how dangerous that is, or what can happen if we browse either intentionally or accidentally to a, a compromised website, which can then, you know, infect our PC with malware and all that. This is stuff that um, should be in, in policies and procedures that users know uh, to follow, part of our information security program, right? Um, but we ultimately want to convert that into due diligence through training, right? Um, the last thing here, don't collect more PII than is absolutely necessary, is actually stated right in the, um, the mass privacy law, so that's actually required by law. The less PII that we collect, then the, that's the less that we have to worry about protecting, right? So that's why... Uh, already talked about a bunch of reasons why the security awareness training is so critical and I, I bring it up re repeatedly as you may have noticed um, I find it as Joe mentioned early on in this presentation I've done a lot of uh, risk assessments and vulnerability assessments for various types of organizations including uh, municipalities and a common thread of a important safeguard that I always find missing is the user awareness and training program and I really think it's just so important you know, you talk about return on investment. You want return on investment. I think you really get that from a training program um, just by converting your users from vulnerabilities into safeguards. Right? Our users are more likely to be diligent and do those things that we talked about on the uh, previous screen if they're uh, if we're able to, you know, sort of modify the culture of them. What do I mean by that is by understanding the real reasons. If you remember early on in the presentation we discussed the real reasons why we're protecting the assets. I think if our users understand that they're going to be on board with a um, what we're going to train them are as far as safeguards and all that in protecting those critical assets. Alright, so another way, another how is by like we said managing and reducing our vulnerabilities. So that's what we're talking about now. A little reminder here of our um, formula for coming up with risk. We've got the threat impact times the threat likelihood. So, like I said, likelihood is really directly related to vulnerability. So, if we're able to reduce our vulnerabilities or weaknesses in our controls, then we're able to reduce likelihood and thus reduce risk. All right. So, a vulnerability assessment will help us identify uh, where the vulnerabilities are. And guess what? We talked about the uh, risk assessment. There's a third critical component that we need for our risk assessment is the vulnerability information because that gives us some information on our likelihood values that we need for our risk assessment. So I mention that because the vulnerability assessment, if you're doing a risk assessment, well, then you're going to end up doing a vulnerability assessment as well. No reason why they can't be done at the same time. Um, as far as once the vulnerabilities are identified in the uh, uh, reducing them or managing them. Patch management, I think, is one of the most important uh, uh, things to do. A lot of the, not all of the vulnerabilities, but a lot of the vulnerabilities will be what we call technical vulnerabilities or uh, missing patches, um, 
you know, people are identifying vulnerabilities, again, weaknesses in Windows operating system and Internet Explorer and all that. They're coming up all of the time, and then Microsoft, it, it's kind of like a rat race. Microsoft races to get patches out to fix that, not just Microsoft, you know, Adobe, Flash Player, or whatever, uh, Java, right, Oracle. Um, so that's just an ongoing Granted, pain in the butt process, but it is important and it is one of the best ways to control and reduce um, especially technical vulnerabilities in our systems, right? Another way to control and reduce vulnerabilities is by uh, implementing a, a technical safeguard that we're going to talk about later, encryption. Um, I mentioned early on about laptops and how that could be one of the places where critical or sensitive information is stored. Um, if it is, then if those laptops are encrypted, um, hopefully with full, what we call whole disk or full disk encryption, then if that laptop is stolen or, or lost, which happens all the time, uh, the whoever stole it or winds up with it won't be able to, well, they won't even be able to boot it up, to be honest with you, but more importantly, they won't, even, they won't be able to take the hard drive out of that unit, out of that laptop, and then put it in another laptop and get at the information. Um, some people think that you know because their laptop requires a password to completely load Windows and to get to the files that um, if the laptop was stolen that somebody wouldn't be able to get at those files but that's just not true um, because you know in the case of you need, if, if I can take the hard drive out of that unit I don't need to boot that hard drive into Windows, I can just add it as another drive to my own copy of Windows that I'm already logged into and access the files that way. Of course, if that whole hard drive is encrypted, I won't be able to do that, so that's why the encryption is so so important uh, on laptops. Uh, the information security program, again, another thing that's required by the uh, mass state law, but also important for a lot of reasons besides the fact that it's law, it's basically the foundation of our whole um, risk management effort and it's where everything is documented and it's what we need to train our, our users on and the, again describes the real reasons for implementing these controls. Um, you know, definitely take the mass privacy laws quote unquote advice and designate a data security coordinator that's responsible for managing and even creating the whole program and then, then managing it on an ongoing basis. Um, so in, certainly include that in the program. Include um, access controls and, and uh, come right out and state that uh, access to sensitive information, particularly PII, uh, is granted only on a need to know basis only to people that have a legitimate reason to know that. Um, responsibilities of all users with access to PAI, well that's the uh, due diligence and common sense stuff that we talked about earlier, right? Don't leave workstations logged in. These are all great um, statements to include in our, in our program and our policies that per pertain to all users and so forth. Uh, password policy, let's not forget about that. Um, we're talking about preventing unauthorized access to sensitive assets, well, the by far most common way that people do that is by requiring um, authentication. In other words, you have to, in order to get access to Munis, you have to log into it and you need to provide a username and password. So that username, really, that username and password combination, particularly the password, is what's the, the differentiator between unauthorized access and authorized access, and it's really the only differentiator, which makes the password itself really important. Um, if your password is one two three, it's kind of defeating the purpose, isn't it? Uh, so, as uh, our designated security program coordinator, or as uh, you know, senior management of the town and password, or uh, sorry, policy implementers, we need to make sure that. Um, if we're relying on passwords, that our pass the passwords that are being used are going to be actually effective and, and good passwords. So let's provide, you know, guidance or even requirements in our information security program and a password policy to state, you know, what what a password needs to look like. And here are some uh, ideas right here. I don't need to read them to you. There's plenty of stuff on the internet about how uh, or password policy examples even to use. But um, I find that they're all pretty much the same, you know, make them at least seven characters and of course make sure that they expire because, you know, once a password becomes months old or, you know, a year or more than a year old, it becomes less and it's becoming less and less uh, of an effective password. So password expiration is important. So, and here are some more chips, uh, tips for choosing a 
a strong password or, or a strong passphrase that you might even include. We'll definitely include in your end user security awareness training program, but considering including it in the uh, information security program policies as well. You know, things like picking uh, you know two words that you can remember and spelling them some you know silly way. Or it just helps. Uh, people to remember their password and hopefully avoid writing them down because as we all know you know the argument against um, forcing password expiration is that well geez we need we're going to force our poor users to have to pick and remember a new password every you know 60 days well yeah we are gonna but we're also going to try to give them some some good advice on on how to pick a password that they would be able to remember right? try to make it a little bit easier for them Uh, once we have all of our policies documented and so forth, we need to make sure that users, first of all, have access to them. We need to store, you know, consider even making some, uh, like an internet website or make the, making them web pages that people can get to uh, fairly easily. And then one of the, uh, in my opinion, mo most important things, and you've heard me say it a million times already, train them on it. <laughs> As part of your end user training program, you know, include the, the specifically the policies that pertain to all users, you know, the due diligence, common sense stuff, and make sure they understand it. Um, and that training is also required by the mass privacy law. And then don't forget to add teeth to, to, to the program. And again, don't think of you know disciplinary actions in the policies describing what they are as scare tactics. I think that's that that's negative and you, you don't need to, to look at it that way. We look at it more as uh, making sure that your users are informed and it, it's being fair to your users by letting them know up front what could happen to them. Not that they would uh, not comply, but if you do, this is what could happen to you. You could even, you know, lose your job. Um, a good um, disciplinary action policy would it might include, you know, sort of tiered uh, levels of things that might happen, uh, notation in an employee record or something like that, on up to um, possibly termination of employment. Uh, it's also important, you know, after we've trained all our users on what the policies are and so forth, to get some type to, you know, record some type of um, acknowledgement in writing that um, each of the users has been through the training. So now you've got a record that they've completed the training, which is good for you and them, um, and also that they've uh, agreed in writing that they will comply with with the policies, and that also makes the the teeth that we talked about a little bit more effective. Uh, should we ever have to implement disciplinary actions. Uh, so we talked about uh, the vulnerability management, the information security program and so forth. Um, continuing on on the how we're protecting the what is with physical and technical safeguards. So of course any virus software, another one of those well pain in the butt type things because it really is annoying users hate, especially more in the old days that the antivirus software really had an impact on performance of computers and it was pretty common for users to try to disable it to get around it to get back some of that performance. Um, I've been noticing, maybe you guys have too, lately that some of the newer antivirus software products out there uh, I think is less, less of a, much less of a performance impact and I think I'm seeing users less likely to try to disable it but in any case we still need to make sure that they can't disable it because uh, one unprotected PC on the LAN is all that's needed for a, of, of, of virus impact. So it's important to have, you know, a, 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 an antivirus program or process and policy, if you will, because it's it's more than just having that, that software running on the computer. It's keeping uh, the signatures up to date all the time, making sure, like I said, that all of the computers are, are protected, uh, running periodic scheduled scans of the computers and all that. So. That's basically another whole topic, potentially for another whole webinar, really, antivirus. Um, authentication is another type of technical safeguard um, that we spoke about a little bit al already. I mentioned the requirement for a username and password to be able to uh, log in. 
to sensitive systems, so it's important to implement that. And I'm going to have to speed up a little bit because um, we're, we're running out of time here. But that's authentication mechanisms should be included in uh, in our safeguards. Facility access controls more on the physical side of physical and technical safeguards. Um, we want to secure access to if we have a you know server room or data center, especially where our tape drives, if we're still using tape, or backup systems, external drives and all that, those external drives are pretty easy to steal, really. Um, little NAS boxes and so forth, so physical security really comes into play in, in locking those rooms. Key management, you know, managing who, who has physical keys and documenting and all that, and again, protecting backup tapes if they're moved, you know, off-site. Off you know, they should be encrypted or somehow protected from unauthorized access. Inactivity, timeouts, uh, locking screensavers perhaps. Um, what that's trying to prevent is our, a user that's uh, in, in, logged into Munis and then decides to go out for a cigarette or something and more often than not, unfortunately, they're not going to log out because they don't want to burden themselves with having to log back in when they come back in. So an inactivity timeout will do that for them <laughs> and prevent that PC from being a vulnerability by being a, a, a machine with an open PII record, for example, on the screen that, that somebody could walk by and read. So an inactivity or locking screensaver will just will automatically lock the screen after, say, five minutes. And then to get back in, you'd have, the user would have to put their password back in to unlock the screen. So a good uh, technical safeguard to have. We need to be logging access, again, required by state law, access to um, PII. Uh, by monitoring the logs, we're meaning there ne either needs to be a, a program in place, a mechanism in place to um, automatically review logs and, and looking for anything that could represent suspicious activity, or you need to have an actual person periodically manually reviewing the logs looking for suspicious access. So um, in order to do that monitoring and viewing, you have to have the log. So make sure logging is enabled, and then make sure you're doing something to actually uh, look at them. And again, I apologize for going fast here, but uh, another important physical safeguard we kind of talked about a little bit, encryption, the importance of um, encrypting sensitive information, especially PII, on things like thumb drives and laptops and all that, because if it's encrypted, it isn't going to come back to hurt us. It isn't going to turn into an unauthorized disclosure, whereas if it's not encrypted, it's going to have to be assumed to be an unauthorized disclosure if that device is lost or stolen. Uh, and then we need to, uh, talking I guess more about availability here, we need to be able to recover from something bad happening like a system downtime type thing or a disk crash or something that maybe corrupts a database. So don't forget to include in your information security program and safeguards a backup and recovery capability and don't forget to include a program for testing it to make sure it works. All right, so we talked about the who, what, why, uh, and so forth, and and, and how. Um, I'm going to, uh, if Joe's still on the line, check with him to see if he wants me to continue on to identifying uh, and reporting suspicious activity, or if, you know, do if we have enough time for that. Are you there, Joe? Yeah, Chris, I'm here. Um, you have about five more minutes to, to wrap up. Okay, you'll let me know then, I guess, where I'll keep going. Um, so a security incident, well, you know, would, would have, again, back to, you know, Wayland, that, that was a security incident, even though the, the $4 million never actually got uh, stolen. Thank, you know, thankfully, the bank prevented that. <clears throat> but um, a, a proper, you know, if, if that town was more prepared with a, with a, incident handling and response program that may not have even gotten that far. So a security incident is, you know, for example, what happened in Wayland or anything that um, has a, a, a negative impact. Uh, but what I want to point out here is that before it's an incident, it's just suspicious activity. Okay, so um, again, re the, the, the concept of our users being a, a vulnerability or, or, uh, or a safeguard, um, one of the uh, best lines of defense for detecting suspicious activity that may become a security incident is through our users. Okay? And so if they know to uh, report anything that they feel may be suspicious, then we're much more prepared to identify that type of stuff. So it's important to identify that. What does it look like, though? What does suspicious activity look like? These are some of the things we want to educate our users on. Something 
Well, out of the ordinary, yeah. Um, start there. Uh, a, a stranger sitting at a, at a PC that you don't recognize. Again, we talked about users always wanting to be nice and friendly and helpful. So, by human nature, they're just going to assume that the person belongs there and kind of mind their own business. But you, as part of this um, modifying culture, you want to try to get your users to just you know politely. Uh, make sure that, that maybe even just report it to somebody or go ahead and you know ask them why they're there um, social engineering being able to recognize a social en engineering uh, attempt if someone asks for your password or login information I'm sure we've all seen this in emails and so forth supposedly coming from our bank or some bank claiming to be our bank saying hey uh, you know we've detected some activity in your account we need to you know log in as you or whatever um, you know type in your your name and password here and send us if you see that believe me it's not from your bank <laughs> that's that is uh, suspicious and do not <laughs> respond to that that email that's a social engineering attempt so if we can educate your users to recognize that that is definitely good um, and then email messages even if they look like they've they come from one person from a particular person an attacker can spoof that and make an email look like it came from one person when it really came from well the attacker. Um, weird stuff happening on your PC, unexpected reboots, um, a login screen that yesterday looked and every day before that looked one way but all of a sudden today looks different. Well, maybe the IT department upgraded the system but maybe it's not really the maybe you're not really logging into the system you think you're logging into so that should be considered suspicious activity as well um, a sudden change in yeah if your your computer is suddenly much much slower than it was well it could be running some processes in the background that are using resources that it shouldn't be running so that should be considered suspicious activity pop-up messages and that type of thing remember the crypto locker virus screenshot I showed you that's a that, that that's a pop-up of course that's ransomware so it's um, but there are other types of uh, malicious software that will do similar things and create similar pop-ups and some of the pop-ups will look like legitimate messages like click here to double the performance of your PC or your PC may be infected click here to remove the virus well don't just click there quest question that because that's again suspicious activity um, and there's an example of of one that I just talked about um, so when we we need our users to not only recognize the suspicious activity but know what to do about it and I think really fundamentally all we really want them to do is tell someone so that means they need to know who to tell so in our information security program or in our incident handling response program that would be part of that program we're going to document who that someone is maybe it's the uh, designated security coordinator that we had to assign to, to as part of our program and to comply with the state privacy law or maybe you know it, it could be any maybe it's an IT person and who knows but it should be documented and your users should all know um, what to report and who to report it to okay um, so that's our, our process for for reporting uh, maybe you want them to just as, as it says here notify their supervisor or manager as opposed to going directly to the security officer include a the, you know a phone number make it as easy as you can for the users to report that stuff because it is important and then whoever they're reporting it to may be involved in the role of determining whether that suspicious activity is uh, may represent a security incident or not. You don't want you know your end users determining that. But somebody somewhat uh, educated or more qualified to make that decision should do that. And if it does become a security incident, then um, now we're beyond the scope of this webinar, but certainly would um, uh, start to take it actions to implement your incident handling plan. So. Uh, that's it. That's uh, we talked about. Uh, uh, hopefully, met our objectives that we described at the very beginning of this presentation here, and as you see on the screen now. Um, and hopefully, you all have some ideas of um, where to get started, protecting yourselves from some of the bad things that can happen. Um, I'm a, you know, I help a lot of our GDS customers with this type of stuff. I love doing it, and um, I get a hold of Joe. Obviously, if you're interested, if you're not already a GDS customer, we'd love to, to help you out with this stuff.